Before the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock and before the settlement at Jamestown in 1607, there was Roanoke, England's first attempt to colonize the New World. On a moonless night in August 1590, English explorer John White sailed into the sound along the outer banks and called out from his ship into the misty darkness surrounding Roanoke Island. It had been three years since White, the governor of Roanoke, had left his daughter, granddaughter, and 115 others behind to go in search of supplies. White had planned to return within a few months, but his plans were thwarted when Spain and England went to war. By the time White returned, the colony had vanished. The disappearance of the Roanoke colony was a baffling mystery. It was to have been England's first foothold in the New World. Queen Elizabeth had told Sir Walter Raleigh to expand her fledgling empire, and Roanoke was to be an important outpost. In 1584, three years before the colony was established, English ships under the command of Captain Philip Amadis and Arthur Barlow found safe harbor along the outer banks, a strip of sand dune islands that line what is today the Carolina coast. They named the area Virginia in honor of England's virgin queen. The island was rich with vegetation, wildlife, and possibilities. Life on the coast was probably uh, excellent, if you must pick a word for it. Uh, the combination of agriculture, a vast array of seafoods, both from the sounds and from the ocean, the products of the forests, and uh, an amazing array of fauna life, uh, deer, bear, raccoon, and so on down the line, a number of small animals, uh, a number of turtles, and uh, things of that nature. To sum it up, it's an extremely rich environment. What the English explorers did not know was that a group of people was living just beyond the tree line at the shore, a people who had lived along the outer banks for hundreds of years. The American Indians, from what I understand, lived a very happy life. They're very fruitful life. They were caretakers of the land, stewards of the land. They understood this. It was almost instinctively. It was as natural to them as breathing. There was a natural order. We had our chiefs, and we had our elders, and our wisdom keepers, and our faith keepers, and our clan mothers. And they all seemed to share an equal role. First contact between natives and English was made when a lone Indian paddling in a canoe bravely approached the English ship. There were awkward attempts at communication. They traded food and trinkets and developed rudimentary ways of speaking to one another. Over the next several weeks, 
the English began expeditions onto the island. For the explorers and for the natives, it was a time filled with great exhilaration, anxiousness, and curiosity. The natives were amazed by the explorers, the way they talked, the way they looked, and the way they dressed. And the English were mesmerized by the exotic natives. Despite their differences, the natives welcomed the explorers with open arms. The natives were extremely friendly, offered to show them the territory, and they explored it briefly, had dinner with the king's brother's wife, and then went back to Raleigh to make a report. They defined the land as the goodliest land under the cope of heaven. Explorer Arthur Barlow wrote, we were entertained with all love and kindness and with as much bounty as they could possibly devise. We found the people most gentle, loving, and faithful, void of all guile and treason, and they lived in the manner of the Golden Age. The explorers returned to England with two natives, Mantio and Wanchis, as evidence of what they had found. Stories of this abundant new world raced through England. The news was especially important to Queen Elizabeth. She wanted to expand her empire, much the way Spain had been doing. She hired privateers, government-backed pirates to sail the seas looking for Spanish ships to plunder. Elizabeth's sea dogs were notorious for filling England's coffers and their own pockets with treasures from Spain. Colonization was a way for the privateers to establish ports in distant lands from which they could operate. A major expedition was assembled. Seven ships and 600 men under the command of Sir Richard Grenville, a seasoned soldier. Grenville was a military man, a privateer. As a matter of fact, he seems to have been far more interested in privateering than he did in other things. But he was interested in the potential of the country, um, perhaps as a base to raid Spanish shipping from, perhaps as a producer of goods that would eventually go to England in a colonial trading situation. We'll never know the exact motif behind his personality. Also on board was John White, a famous artist and explorer who painted these images of life on 16th century Roanoke. Thomas Harriet, a scientist who was hired to keep records of what was found on the expedition, wrote an account of the journey a brief and true report of the new found land of Virginia. The people there are poor by our standards and want of skill and knowledge in the use of things. But though they have no tools, crafts or sciences as our own, they show excellent wit. They show great friendliness toward us and desire our friendships and love. But unlike the expedition a year earlier, Grenville's visit turned into a disaster. Relations with the natives took an ominous turn over a silver cup. One of the Indians had taken a silver cup. That's uh, disputable. Uh, they simply 
may have thought of that as an exchange of gifts, not knowing the English and there for a very short period of time. But Grenville's reaction to that act was to burn the village, burn the crops, and therefore set the stage for a pattern of reactions that would eventually seal the fate of the lost colony. It started a bitter legacy that would last for the next 300 years. When we return, starving English explorers seek revenge. In September 1585, after three months on Roanoke Island, Sir Richard Grenville returned to England to get supplies. He left 100 men in a small fort, a circular earth mound with a stockade fence on top. The men were under the command of Ralph Lane. Lane was the consummate military commander. His reaction to everything was from a commander's standpoint and not as a statesman. Lane's orders from Grenville to scout the land for resources and to survive a winter in the New World. But the winter was uncommonly harsh. The English ran dangerously low on supplies. They went to the only place they could for help, the natives, who supplied the settlers for a while. But Wingina, the beloved king of the Roanoke natives, feared the starving English would deplete his already short supplies. He moved his people off the island, leaving the colonists to starve. Ralph Lane wrote about the desperate situation. If the savages should not help us, and our supplies fail us, we might very well starve, like a starving horse in a stable. If we escape, it will be only by the hand of God. For military men who didn't know anything about farming, living off the frozen foreign land was nearly impossible. These were professional men, miners, soldiers. They were used to colonization, used to work but they were also used to being in an environment where it was possible to go to a shop and buy cloth or food. On Roanoke Island, the, uh, their only sources of food were to kill or to catch or to get from the Native Americans. The spring of 1586 brought relief to the starving explorers. They had survived by resorting to such extreme measures as killing their own dogs for food. Now they were bitter and looking for revenge. They walked into King Wingina's village under the guise of wanting to negotiate peace. But when Ralph Lane cried out, Christ our victory, a signal to his men, they attacked. Wingina was shot twice, but escaped into the woods. Lane sent his fastest man after the dying chief and had him beheaded. Days later, the English privateer Sir Francis Drake arrived. He had been plundering Spanish galleons near Puerto Rico and stopped at Roanoke to see the English settlement. What he found were settlers on the verge of war. Since Grenville's supply ship had not yet returned, Lane and his men abandoned Roanoke and instead of waiting, sailed home to England with Drake. But within a week, Grenville arrived. Finding no one on Roanoke and knowing the Queen's desire for a permanent colony in the New World, Grenville ordered 15 of his men to stay at the abandoned fort not knowing that the natives were watching and waiting to strike. In England, the fascination with the New World continued. 
In May 1587, Sir Walter Raleigh, under orders from Queen Elizabeth, sent ships to America with 117 men, women, and children. The settlers were under the direction of artist John White, who was made governor of the new land because of his prior experience there. White was traveling with his son-in-law and daughter Eleanor, who was six months pregnant. The settlers were adventurers. They were promised vast tracts of land in exchange for their willingness to colonize the far-off, unknown America. It was a dangerous venture, and they knew it was unlikely they would ever return to England. There were about 20 families that were interrelated by marriage, cousinage, blood, or guild membership. We have a series of people who have particular trades, a series of people who are gentlemen and wealthy, and they are here to establish some territory in the New World that can be theirs. Each person who came in 1587 was most likely given 500 acres along the Chesapeake Bay. The group planned to travel to Roanoke Island, pick up the 15 men left by Grenville the previous year, and head north to a large bay the natives called Chesapeake. The water was deeper there and would make for a better harbor than the shallow shoals of the outer banks. But when the convoy arrived at Roanoke, they found one skeleton and the fort destroyed. Grenville's men had disappeared. Despite this, the captain of their ship, Simon Fernandez, had other plans. As the colonists prepared to head north to Chesapeake, Fernandez said he was sailing to deeper waters to search for Spanish galleons. I'm in Fernandez, the captain of the expedition this time, was anxious to get back to making money on the high seas, refused to take the colonists any further, and simply discharged them here on Roanoke Island. And therefore put them literally into a hornet's nest of conflict. They were dumped into an environmental and social mess. They did not know the extent to which Lane had infuriated the Indians. And they were too late in the season arriving to plant their own fields. When we return, John White sails for England and the settlers of the lost colony struggle to survive. When the families of the lost colony arrived on Roanoke, they had no idea how bad relations with the natives had become. A permanent English settlement on native lands only made things worse. The bottom line is people come in from faraway shores, they come in, they set up home, and they basically say it's time for you to head them up and move them out. You can only imagine what the people felt like. There's no way to justify it. There's no way to excuse it. There's no way that uh, two words, I'm sorry, can make up for it. There's no way that we can go back and collect the rent. But the English had a more pressing problem finding housing and food. If there were, was not enough food for 100, certainly there was not enough food for 117. Additionally, many of the supplies were damaged in unloading from the ships, so they were under hardship from the start. A few weeks after they arrived, one of the colonists was killed by natives while fishing. Fear gripped the settlers. Any expedition away from the fort meant risking their lives. 
But Roanoke Governor John White found a friend, Mantio, one of the Indians who had traveled to England two years earlier. He lived on a neighboring island called Croatan. Mantio had been fascinated by his trip to England. Though other natives were now making war against the English, Mantio remained faithful. Mantio agreed to act as an intermediary with the other tribes. He told White that a meeting would be arranged on August 6th to try to make peace between the English and the other natives. The day passed with no contact. White took it as a sign that the natives wanted war. He organized an attack party. In the middle of the night, White's men attacked the first village they found. Unfortunately, he attacked the wrong tribe. He attacked the friendly Indians of Croatoan. They had been harvesting fields at a village abandoned by the Roanoke natives. Two of the Croatans were killed in the battle. Mantio's people were ready for war. It took white weeks to convince them that the attack was a mistake. Amidst the hostilities with the natives, and while the new colonists attempted to repair the fort and plant crops, John White's daughter, Eleanor Dare, gave birth to a baby girl named Virginia. This was the first child of English parentage to be born in the New World, and so therefore was a symbol of stability uh, to the colony and certainly important to us. A few days after Virginia Dare was born, the colonists elected John White to return to England. He was reluctant to leave. It is not clear whether White was sent back because he was the man most capable of getting supplies and returning quickly to Roanoke, or because the settlers wanted to get rid of him and his heavy-handed dealings with the natives. John White says that he did not want to go, but he did secure a letter from the council and from the colony saying that he did not want to go, but they had insisted that he go to represent them. But of course, this is in John White's journal now, isn't it? Regardless of his reasons, John White set sail for England on August 27th, 1587. He made a pact with the settlers. If they had to leave before he returned, they should leave some kind of sign to indicate where they were going. As the island of Roanoke disappeared from view, it was the last time any Englishman would see the colonists alive. When we return, efforts to supply the Roanoke colonists are thwarted by the largest naval armada the world had ever seen. As John White completed his voyage home from Roanoke Island, he sailed into port in England and was amazed. The nation was preparing for a massive naval war with Spain. White had planned to spend the winter of 1587 gathering supplies for the settlers of Roanoke Island and then return the following spring. But Queen Elizabeth had other plans. She needed every ship in her empire to fight the massive armada assembled by Spain's King Philip. Even a personal request by Sir Walter Raleigh, the Queen's hand-picked lieutenant whose job was to find new areas for England to conquer, was not enough. For three frustrating years, John White waited. He made two attempts to leave England, but failed. Eventually, after English ships had defeated Spain's armada, 
White was given permission to return. When he arrived at Roanoke on a summer's night in 1590, he had no idea what he would find. At daybreak, White went ashore with a search party. He found no one. The only evidence of life were some footprints of bare feet in the sand. It was not a good omen. The English never went without shoes. White anxiously led his men to the north shore of the island, calling out, hoping to find someone. When he arrived at the area where the Roanoke Fort had been, he found the land vacant. Everything was gone. When he arrived, he found that the houses had been taken down, which means disassembled. There was no evidence of violence, attack, stress in any form. But White found two intriguing clues. The word Croatan was carved onto a post, and the letters C-R-O were carved into the bark of a tree. Croatan was the name of Mantio's home island to the south. White thought the cryptic communication might be a good sign. Perhaps his pact with the settlers had worked. They had agreed that if forced to leave Roanoke, they would try to give some word about where they were headed. And if they had to leave the island in haste, if they were under attack, for instance, the colonists agreed to put a cross over the name of the place to which they were going. There was no cross above the words. When White returned in 1590, according to his report, um, he felt relieved because he knew where the colony had gone. White's men discovered five chests hidden in the woods. The chests contained books and papers, but no word on the fate of the missing colonists. White took this as a good sign. The settlers must have planned to return for the things they could not carry with them on their journey. White wrote, Many of the things inside the chests were spoiled and broken. The covers torn off books, the frames of some pictures ruined in the rain, and my armor almost eaten through with rust. But I took great joy in that I had found a token of their being safe at Croatoan, the place where the savages of the land were our friends. White returned to his ship, planning to sail to Croatan the following day. But he was stopped, first by the weather, and then by the captain of the expedition, who was anxious to get back to his main order of business, raiding Spanish galleons traveling along the coast. The ship that White was on was calling here with only a few arms to be left for the colony, no other supplies, and White was reluctantly taken on as a passenger. And he was completely at their mercy in terms of the decisions they made. In this case, weather intervened. And instead of going on to Croatan or to Chesapeake to find out whether they were there, uh, the weather chased them away from the coast again, and they went back to the business of privateering. After weeks of plundering Spanish galleons, the ship's captain set sail for England. There was some plan that they would not go directly to England, but would just leave the area of the storm and go elsewhere to winter and then come back. But that didn't work out. They all returned to England. And that is the last time John White uh, was ever in the New World. What evils or unfortunate events could have been avoided if I had returned on time to the colony? 
I would give to God all my wealth to know what has become of them. I pray to the Almighty to help and to comfort them. White died three years later, never knowing the fate of his daughter, granddaughter, and the rest of the Roanoke colonists. What happened in the meantime to the colonists left here on Roanoke Island is only a guess. But apparently the forces of nature and culture simply became too great and they decided to move. When we return, the mystery of the lost colony deepens and the search for missing colonists begins. For 20 years after the disappearance of the lost colony of Roanoke, England made no official attempt to find the colonists. Crews aboard privateering ships in the region would occasionally stop, but there was no trace of the settlers. Between 1590, when White left unable to find the colony, and the establishment of Jamestown, there were no further attempts to locate the colonists. How much this mattered to people in England is really a matter of to whom you would be speaking. People just were not interested in the colony anymore. Then in 1607, the English settled Jamestown, Virginia. Fierce battles with the natives broke out. The English soon learned that what had happened 20 years earlier at Roanoke had not been forgotten. The new settlers began to speculate on the fate of the Roanoke colonists. Some believe the settlers may have been killed by Spanish soldiers who patrolled the waters of America's east coast, looking to avenge Spain's massive losses to English privateers. But if the Roanoke settlers had been wiped out by the Spanish or even vengeful natives, why would the entire village have been disassembled? Scholars believe the houses were taken down with the intent of being reassembled elsewhere. Others believe the settlers did leave the island and could have drowned at sea. But if they didn't drown, what happened to them? The most logical explanation was that the colonists had moved. But if they survived, why did they not attempt to contact the English who settled Jamestown? Many experts agree that the colonists most likely went to Croatan and then moved with Manteo's tribe to the mainland. Croatan is not a large island, and the addition of more than 100 English settlers would have strained the natives' ability to gather enough food for everyone. During the settlement of Jamestown, William Strachey, a member of the colony, had been instructed to investigate the location of Raleigh's colony. Information did come to Strachey from Native American sources that some, if not all, of the colony had survived and were located uh, with the Chesapeake Indians. But no contact was ever made. The ruler of the Virginia natives reported that the Roanoke settlers had joined the Chesapeake natives, but had been annihilated in a battle. But over the next century, explorers and colonists in the area reported seeing strange native tribes living along the Carolina coast. Some of the tribes were said to live in two-story houses. Others spoke English or had English names. In 1730, one group of explorers said they found a tribe of natives who had blonde hair and blue eyes and practiced Christianity. But scholars are skeptical of these sightings, mainly because there is no physical evidence linking any native tribe to the lost colony. We'll never know the evidence being so scanty. I'm convinced that there were some of them left at Croatan and simply failed.
faded into Croatan society. A few people without any major support of their own culture can do that far more easily than something as large as the lost colony in mass. Some scholars believe that it was drought that drove the colonists from the island, but this recent theory has only added to the intrigue. For the next three centuries, the story of the lost colony remained a local legend. In the 20th century, the fascination with the mystery was revived in 1937 when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, an avid amateur historian, traveled to Roanoke. 350 years after the English attempted to colonize the island, Roosevelt presented a birth certificate to the Roanoke community for Virginia Dare, officially naming her the first English citizen born in America. The president also personally designed a commemorative stamp issued in her honor. In addition, a statue was erected depicting Virginia Dare as a young woman. And a play entitled The Lost Colony opened on the island. For the past 60 years, it has performed every summer to sell out crowds. Today, the island is a national historic site operated by the United States Park Service. In recent years, the earth fort that was built by the first English settlement party in 1585 has been restored. Now in 1991, a team of archaeologists were here and they found evidence of work done by two men who were here with Ralph Lane's group, a metallurgist by the name of Joachim Gans, who was from... The lost colony is a mystery. People love mystery, and especially a mystery that treats the foundation of English America. Archaeologists and geologists are interested in the area. Every summer they dig deep into the Carolina soil looking for clues. This dig on the island of Croatan is led by Dr. David Phelps. 220 and then mark it at 240. The black zone from here to here without shell is the occupation that uh, represents the last Croatan. That would have been the historic colony-related Croatan. Teams are also searching the waters surrounding Roanoke and nearby islands, looking for anything that would give them clues as to what happened to the 117 men, women, and children who settled here. If the colonists set sail from Roanoke, searchers believe artifacts of their journey could be found on the ocean floor. In 1992, archaeologists found the remains of what is believed to be the first laboratory in America, a wooden shack filled with crucibles, pots for ointments, and rudimentary tools used for making medicine. It has not been determined if the remains were from the lost colony or settlers who came later. Even as evidence of the past comes to light, the story of the lost colony continues to haunt us. They were not lost. They knew where they were. Our problem is we don't know where they went because we do not have enough evidence to corroborate the report from the Jamestown settlement. Therefore, this is the stuff of which legends are made. People love legends. And this one is so well established and so nostalgic 
and so important to the very beginning of European beginnings of North Carolina. And it has the potential of never being solved as a mystery, which makes it even more enticing. So anyone can guess, anyone can speculate, anyone can theorize about it. That is, until we find some solid evidence. But I think it will always be one of the more important legends of the early history of North Carolina, simply because of the, the unknown value of it. The members are made to feel kind of on edge. The victims of a mass suicide pact. One does not simply passively await for the end of the world to take place. One joins in that process to help it along. Cults. Dangerous Devotion. Wednesday at 8 on History International.